Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. All right, nice, thanks. Glad you're all here this morning. My name's John Holler. I'm the CEO of the museum, and I'm so happy to welcome all of you today to Talking to the Future. It's just been an excellent program for us, and it's really rolling now, and it's rolling because of you, and we're so happy to have you here this morning. We're going to do a little bit of talking right now, so get ready. I know you've been busy working, so your brains are engaged, and some of you have been down to the exhibition and seen a little bit of the museum, and uh, now we're just going to have a really fun day, and you're going to meet some really, really cool people here in just a minute. So I've got a couple of jobs this morning. The first is to introduce you to each other, because you may be wondering, if you haven't all met, gosh, who am I in this room with, and what are we all going to be doing together, and why are we all here? So my job is to give you a little bit of an overview of that, so let me just begin with that. First of all, John F. Kennedy High School in Fremont, where are you guys sitting? All right, hands up for Fremont. Great. Great to have you guys here. Uh, Olivia Santillan. Olivia? Hi. Welcome. Thanks for bringing your class. Uh, she's delivering the big history curriculum to her ninth grade class. Big history curriculum is so cool. Congratulations for taking that on. Uh, they're talking about uh, everything from the Big Bang, which is ancient history, to the future, which has not been made yet, but maybe it's going to be made here today, and they've been uh, working on a program we have called Get Invested, which some of you know about, for a couple of years. We're really glad to have JFK in Fremont. How about a hand for Fremont? Good. Second, buenos dias y bienvenidos a mis amigos de la Prepa Udem in Monterrey, Mexico. Where's Prepa Udem this morning? Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I know spring has arrived. Spring has arrived when Prepa Udem is in the house again, because you guys have been here every year since we started this program. I'm now working on my second uh, Ser Humano, Ser Udem notebook. I absolutely maxed out the first one, so I hope you brought me some new ones this year. Adriana Holguin has been working with Get Invested and, and you guys and your team this year. Thank you so much. Uh, and we really have to think of Adriana as a co-developer uh, co of our curriculum for the Get Invested uh, project. She, it's been a, a co-production and just a great partnership for a long time. And I know you guys are here to see Silicon Valley in San Francisco. You're going to have an awesome, awesome trip. I hope you're happy about that. We're so glad you're including us in that again this year. All right, so give it up for Prepa Udem. <clears throat> El Cerrito High School, where are you guys? El Cerrito, welcome. Welcome this morning. Chris Morita has been bringing students from El Cerrito High School uh, for quite some time. We've been doing workshops with you guys, and uh, I think this is your first Talking to the Future morning. So welcome. Hope you have a great day. Let's give it up for El Cerrito. And Burlingame. Where's Burlingame High School this morning? Wow. All right. You guys are all scattered around. Good morning, Burlingame. I know you guys have been here for high school workshops, too. Christina Wade, where, Christina, where are you? Hi. Good to have you here. So glad to have you guys here this morning. I think this is your first Talking to the Future. We're really excited to have you. So welcome. Let's have a hand uh, for Burlingame. And finally, let me thank our very generous sponsors who make this day and this program available. First of all, our good friends at Intel. Intel is the founding sponsor of uh, Talking to the Future. It was uh, the brainchild of uh, uh, someone at Intel who was a very important uh, person, an Intel fellow uh, there, who, who actually gave it the name and uh, said that we should have this program, and, and that's how we got started on this. So Intel has been more than just... Uh, an underwriter, but a true partner in the content of this. Uh, the Severance Family Foundation has been a big supporter of the museum's education programs from the very, very beginning of the programs, and we're delighted to have Severance uh, be a part of this. Oracle, of course, uh, is depicted up there. We're delighted to have Oracle and also the SanDisk Foundation. Uh, and the cool thing about uh, those, those three companies that I mentioned, Intel, Oracle, SanDisk, they were all founded by people like you. They all got started with people who were trying to think of a different world and wanted to do amazing things and had an idea, and they worked on it. And that's how, that's how this happens. So uh, that's why we're delighted to have them involved in it, because their story is really 
told here at the museum, and it's, it can be everyone's story, and we're delighted to welcome them as our sponsors. So let me talk a little bit about the panelists. You're going to hear more about all of them this morning. These, uh, these folks really are rock stars. Uh, we're very, very happy to have them here this morning. I think you're going to have a fun time with them, and they're delighted to be here with you. Tim Olson is the VP for Education and Technology at KQED. That is a big job. KQED is a very digital place now, and Tim runs a huge amount of that. Ryan Germick of the Google Doodle team. Ryan leads the Google Doodle team, so you're going to meet Ryan. And uh, Saraba Madan, who's a data analyst at Google. We're delighted to have uh, Google well represented both by Saraba and by Rena Singali, who works with voice recognition for Android at Google. How many of you guys carry an Android phone? All right. Google's Android's well represented. Congratulations. And Rich Hilleman, finally, who's the uh, chief creative director at Electronic Arts. Anybody play uh, games from EA here? You guys are gamers? All right, nice. Well, you're going to enjoy meeting Rich. Uh, finally, one quick story. So we have a lot of events at the museum every year. Last year, we did 370 events at the museum. And so there are 365 days in a year. And that means we're pretty busy pretty much every day. And just right across the way this morning, there's a team of young developers from LinkedIn. Have you guys heard of LinkedIn? Anybody heard of LinkedIn? Who's got a profile page on LinkedIn already? Great. All right, super. Uh, so LinkedIn is a little company that got started about 10 years ago or so uh, with some people who had an idea like Facebook, except they thought it would be great if you could connect with people in your careers so that you could get to know people who are professionals kind of on an upper track like you. No idea like that ever has to succeed. Many ideas are hatched every day like LinkedIn, and a lot of them don't succeed. But LinkedIn has succeeded. LinkedIn is just down the way now, probably less than a mile from here. You could walk there. Uh, and they use the museum a lot for, uh, for bringing in groups of people and helping them work in teams. And that's what they're doing this morning. And I think if you went over and you asked the LinkedIn people this morning, what could you teach me about about getting ready, about the things that I, that I need to know, things that may even put me in the computer history museum someday. I think they'd tell you things like, problems get solved in teams. You have to have creative ideas and certainly be dedicated to those ideas on your own. But it also helps to listen to others and have respect for their ideas and not be afraid of failure, because there's a lot of failure out there before their success. But if you pull together and you use your ingenuity and your imagination and you respect each other and keep working in that fashion, you'd be amazed what you can do. Jeff Weiner, who's the CEO of LinkedIn, I've heard him talk about this many, many times. And that's what talking to the future is about. It's about helping us have a conversation with you and helping you have a conversation with people like the great panelists that we're going to have here this morning. And, uh, and then working together and meeting each other, people from all parts of the world and all parts of the valley. So that's the essence of the program, and I hope you have a great time today with each other and a great time at the museum. So my, uh, my pleasure now is to introduce Lauren Silver, who's the Vice President of Education here. Uh, this is partly her brainchild, and she's got a great team that she works with to pull this uh, uh, together every year, and she's going to tell you a little bit more about the program and the day. Thanks, everyone. I'm so glad to be here with you, and have a great experience. Hi, everyone. For those of you teachers and students who have been here to the museum before, either for Get Invested or for Talking to the Future, you may notice that this is the biggest group that we have had for this program since we started it, which is really, really exciting. So we're also doing a lot of really great things for all of you today. You may have noticed that you are not, you're not here mingling just with your classmates. So look around your table. You have people from all different schools. John was talking about teamwork. He was talking about collaboration. He was talking about working together to problem solve. You're going to be doing that today because what Talking to the Future is about is about getting lots of different people together to share lots of really cool ideas. You guys have probably heard words like innovation and collaboration and leadership and teamwork and partnership thrown around at school, thrown around as skills that you need in the workplace, thrown around as skills and things that you need in your daily life. 
Today you get to practice those, but in a really cool way and with really cool people. So what we're going to do today, you already started that. You already started doing a little bit of that in your teams, in your color-coded teams, and now at your table teams, down in the galleries. You worked with docents to learn a little bit about the history of computing and to consider some issues like biotechnology and what is a computer and the role of computers in our daily lives, art, literature, music. Those are kinds of things that you need to consider as you move into the real world, especially as you think about applying technology in the real world, both in your daily lives and in work. So we're going to continue that for the rest of the day. And as you can see behind me, we have a pretty good schedule for you. So 10.15 to 11.15, what we're going to start, we're a little behind schedule. We're going to keep you going, though. We're going to have a discussion with all of those people that John was mentioning before. So you guys are going to get to hear from them about what they do every day in their jobs and how they got there. So a lot of you may be thinking, yeah, I don't know, technology, engineering, I'm not so sure. I'm more interested in humanities. I'm more interested in language. I'm more interested in art. That may be true, but you may be surprised at some of the paths that people have followed from the interest they had when they were in high school to where they are now and how much of that kind of creativity and experience and question asking really informed how they got to where they are today, not just what they're doing today. So you get a chance to hear from them. After that, you're going to get a chance to meet each of our innovators in person. You can see that there's a whiteboard, there's tables all around. You're going to get to talk with them up close and personal, as they say. In your workbooks, if you haven't gone through them yet, you'll see that you have a page that says questions for innovators. We're going to ask you to visit at least three innovators tables. And we've suggested some questions that you might ask them. We're going to ask you to please make some notes about some of the ideas that they spark for you when you talk to them. We'll have lunch together. And then you will get back into your colored teams, where you are now, and each of your groups is going to work with one of our innovators in depth. Every one of them has brought a really important challenge that really comes from the kinds of ideas and problems that they're working with at work on a daily basis here because they want your input. This is going to be fast. It's going to be fun. You're going to get to figure out real answers to real problems, and we're going to ask you to share them with each other and do some sharing with us as well. You're going to create prototypes. You're going to think about, really, how am I going to solve this problem? Think about the qualities John was talking about before, collaboration, leadership. Leadership was just not just taking charge and saying, oh, I know how to do this, and I'm going to take it and, take it and just do it, but stepping back and letting your team also support those ideas, right? Collaboration, innovation, all of those things, they're all going to come into play. So it's going to be a really fun day. We're really looking forward to seeing the kinds of things that you come up with with your group. We're looking forward to getting to know you and our innovators better. And I'm going to give it to Amy Gardner, who is our manager of school and teacher programs, to kick it off. Thank you. Okay, so fart. Here are two, three, four, and five innovators. So good morning, everybody. I'm Amy Gardner. I help manage the school programs here, and we put together what we thought was a really interesting panel for you guys. And um, the reason that they're here today is because they're going to tell you a little bit about what they do, what kind of problems they solve at work and how they got interested in technology in the first place, so that when you visit them later, you'll have a kind of inside scoop on who they are, and then you'll get to know them before the design challenge. So um, we're going to start with Tim. Um, just a brief introduction. Okay. Who are you? Uh, Where do you work? And what do you do? Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Tim, Tim Olson. Um, I am the uh, head of the digital group and the education group at KQED. Uh, for those who are not familiar with KQED, it is the PBS and NPR station in the Bay Area. Uh, for those of you from uh, out of the country, uh, this is public media. So we have make uh, news and arts and science, television and radio, 
um, and online content uh, for the public and give it away for free. And uh, what do I do? So um, I work with uh, an amazing team. A couple of them are here, Jamidra and Lauren, um, on making content, television shows, radio shows, online applications, and uh, services for the general public, and then also services for you as learners. So we actually make things like uh, e-books for the iPad, of which is kind of like a modern textbook. Uh, we make video profiles of artists so that you can learn how an artist works, and then we follow up with a activity, like how you can actually do an activity yourself. So there's a whole series of uh, online content that we provide for students and educators to help them learn news, arts, and science. Thank you. Hey, Rena. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Rena Singhal Lee, and I'm a technical program manager at Google. I currently work in our speech team. The speech team works on all of the back end speech recognition for Google. So anytime anyone talks to Google, whether it's through an Android phone, an Android tablet, Chrome, Google Glass, any product where you're speaking to Google, we're actually uh, the ones that handle taking your audio and turning it into text into something that, you can, that we're able to show you results for or whatever you are trying to get to next. And speech recognition has been a really interesting problem, so I, I think it's a, it's a growing area. People are using it more and more as they're on the go and trying to communicate to phones and tablets. So um, it's a really exciting technology that I'm excited to talk to you guys more about. Thanks, Serena. How about you, Ryan? So my name is Ryan Germick, and I, I lead the Doodle team. Um, I stole this quote from, like, Google's, Google has a web page called 10 Things I Learned to be, uh, That We've Learned to Be True. Um, and essentially what we do is on the home pages of, of Google around the world is we mash up the Google logo with some sort of occasion or something that we want to celebrate. Sometimes it's just an illustration, sometimes it's a video game or, or a movie. I have a really talented team of folks that I work with that are artists and engineers and there's literally hundreds of people around the company at Google who contribute to Doodles in some way. Um, yeah, and we just try to make the most surprising and delightful experience that we can on this canvas that is seen by most of the world with the internet. And um, yeah, it's, it's a joy to be here with you all. I actually, when, you know, I, I started to get interested in computers around uh, high school time and went to art school and was an artsy person, but also a bit of a closet nerd and um, excited to see what you all are thinking and what you're all up to. Thank you. Okay, Rich, how about you? Ryan's a Prince fan too, but we're going to bring that up exactly. many yeah. times today. I didn't see that on the agenda, but I plan on talking about Prince for most of the day. So I, I, this is not what I do. So that's the guy who sits next to me. <laughs> that's the hovering art director. This, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, make that more blue, please. No, it, it's uh, uh, what I do is I'm chief creative director at Electronic Arts, which means a lot of things. It's really in three categories. I work on the platforms that we build our games on. So last year that included things like the Xbox One and the PlayStation 4, but it also means connected television. So we worked on a game for the Chinese connected television market, and we worked on a gaming service with Comcast. Um, we also work on uh, Electronic Arts' relationship with um, the people that are gonna be our future. So I spent a lot of time teaching classes in college, and about at any given point in time, half the people that work for me are doing their first job out of school. Um, and the last thing we work on is products, and sometimes that's doing new things for new markets, for new customers, and sometimes that's because an oil well is on fire, and we have to go make sure one of the products that matter a lot to us ships. So uh, that's the range of things I do. Thank you. And how about you, Saurabh? Hi, my name is Saurabh. I am a data scientist at Google, and uh, I've worked in different questions within Google. One of the questions was, how do we determine what's a fair and equitable way to pay someone? Uh, I've also worked on other aspects uh, of uh, data center technology. So what most people call the cloud is actually you know, a bunch of machines and computers which are actually physically hosting data. Like when you think of the cloud, you know, picture a football size field of machines. And some of those machines get uh, bad, some of them break. How do you determine what to repair when in the fastest possible time. It's, it's a very exciting, interesting problem. And uh, you know, that's just a flavor of a couple of things that I've worked on. Thank you. So I'm wondering, um, 
Sometimes what you're studying in school is not what you ended up doing now at all. Does anyone have a particularly interesting story about how you got where you are now and how it might be something totally different from what these guys might expect? Uh, I was a philosophy major. Uh, so <laughs> if you want to know about Plato or Aristotle or those kind of things. Uh, and uh, my first job was in uh, communication, so I just worked at a uh, station where they like, you know, send out press releases and do things like that. And then it was lucky because it was like the early days of when the internet started to go into people's homes and you're all too young to remember the AOL disks or a CompuServe disks that would come in the mail. And I would, it was just kind of young and naive and I would take them down to the people who run the computers at, at the station and I'd be like, we should make an internet site. And they would just kind of said, hey, uh, kid, go ahead. And uh, so it's kinda, it was kind of nice because it was so early I didn't know anything about it, but I just bought one of those books about like how to do HTML, and because no one else like really cared about that particular thing, uh, that's how I got started doing computers from start from a degree in philosophy. <laughs> Anyone else have a kind of circuitous way of getting into technology? I think one one of the, for me the, maybe the biggest uh, thing that contributed. I mean, a lot of factors that lined up to uh, contributing, but. Um, one of the biggest factors contributing to where I am today is I, I went to India for a year in college. And um, I was in art school. And when I went to India, at that, back in the time, it, there wasn't Skype or anything like that. This is like year 2000 and um, way back. <laughs> um, so it cost like a dollar a minute to call home. Oh, yeah. it, you had to go into an ST, a un, very unfortunately named STD booth was the name. <laughs> That's really what it's called. Still so called it. <laughs> Yeah, so I didn't. I clearly did not want to go into an SED booth. Um, uh, and um, but what I did have is um, I had a really crappy digital camera. It was like one of the first digital cameras on the market. You actually use a floppy disk for it. A Mavica. A, a, a Sony FD Mavica. The FD stand for floppy disk. Yeah, exactly. And um, I bought like a box of like a hundred floppy disks at Costco, and I took like thirty pictures a day or something. And like the, the for like a year, and the way that I would communicate with my family is I actually made this really junky website. Um, another thing that I did while I was in India is when I got there, I noticed how amazing the signage was. So if you've ever been to India, unfortunately it's now kind of in this sort of crappy Photoshop world, but um, there at the time was amazing hand painted signs everywhere. It was just so uh, like if you were for like a barber shop, and there'd be like the a celebrity portrait or something, and somebody painstakingly. Um, painted or like a goddess or something for like a motorcycle repair shop and I was like I want to do that and so I actually took a class I actually found a sign painter and I just and we I spoke a little bit of Tamil he spoke no English and he basically was my teacher for a year and how he did sign painting and so at this time where I went to India and I basically did this rudimentary web stuff and I learned how to do sign painting was a pretty good preparation to do essentially what I do now which is sign painting on the internet <laughs> All right, did anyone take a kind of more straightforward path into technology? I think I took a pretty traditional path. Um, <laughs> I did my bachelor's and master's in electrical and computer engineering, and I did my MBA part-time um, at UT Austin while I was working at Intel in Austin. I did that in the evenings twice a week, um, just trying to balance that with work. And after about eight years at Intel, I moved out here to Google in California, and. So I think it's a pretty traditional tech path. Um, but I would say that in high school, I really thought, and in prior to high school and in high school, I always thought I was going to study medicine. I thought I was going to be a doctor. Everything, like from colleges, I was getting about pre-med. And, um, and you know, when I would shadow people, it would always be doctors. That's just my path in my head. And so the summer before my senior year, I spent the summer volunteering in a hospital. But I passed out three times, Got and right um, <laughs> yeah. I decided I need to pick something else. Like this isn't working. And um, after those three incidents, that, which were like way more than I ever expected, I decided to just choose something else. And I'm really happy I did. I'm really excited about what I've done. I ended up doing a minor in biomedical engineering in, in college, so it was a good mix of my interest in medicine, but still on the engineering side. And um, but I'm really happy with the path I've taken. Keeping on the engineering path, how about you? What was your path? Sure, so, 
So I had somewhat of a, a consistent scientific, but a very circuitous path to what I'm doing today. I started doing, uh, believe it or not, metallurgical and material science engineering. And, and then I did a degree in physics. Uh, right after that degree in physics, I was recruited to start people operations in Google, which is our version of HR, uh, using maths and numbers, but bringing them to a field which had traditionally been sort of uh, more heavy on soft skills. And what I've found in my experience is that if you are curious and passionate and you're always asking why are things the way they are, uh, you're always questioning the status quo, approaching it from uh, a, an objective frame of mind, that has applications you know, in fields very diverse and fields that you would intuitively not think are connected, as happened in my case. Rich, <laughs> you're quiet. Yeah, that's because I'm the weird one, of course. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. How many people in this room were alive in 1972? Yeah. <laughs> so so uh, I, I was in elementary school in a place called Hopkins, Minnesota in 1972, and they told me I could get out of math class if I would program a computer. <laughs> and, and I'm just not that smart enough to know how to miss an opportunity like that. So, so I would go sit in this little closet that was essentially the, like the custodian's closet where they put the brooms. And they had a teletype in there and a, and a 110 uh, coupler. And I, I would write a basic program that had like five lines and printed out you know, an equation. And my math teacher thought I was a genius. <laughs> but the real thing that was true was on that same computer system, there were about five games. And those were all teletype games that you'd, they asked you a question, you typed oh, in yeah. a number, and something happened. And so what I learned is that I could go to math class, and for five minutes of programming, I could get 40 minutes of game time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I've never looked back. Uh, I've used that lead at every step of the way. So after I was in elementary school, I went to a junior high school, and they said, you know what, let's be novel in 1975 and offer a computer class in school. And so they taught exactly the same class I'd been taught in elementary school again. Th then I went to a high school in Las Vegas, Nevada, and they said, you know what, let's have a novel idea. Let's teach a computer science class in high school. So they taught exactly the same class. Same <laughs> textbook, by the way. Exactly wow. the same textbook. <laughs> so I've now taken it three times. I went to UNLV. I did not finish, but I went to UNLV. The very first class I took at UNLV was Introduction to Computers, which used, guess which book they used. <laughs> <laughs> same book. Now, here's the real irony at the bottom of that is the computer that I first used in the 1972 was called a CDC 6400, Com Control Data 6400, built by Seymour Cray. You may have heard that name yeah. before. So Seymour, um, Seymour, was, Seymour Cray is a great builder of supercomputers. So I used the 6400 in 1972. When I went and took the junior high class, it was on the same CDC 6400. Then when I moved to Las Vegas, when I took the, the class that I took in high school, it was on UNLV's CDC 6400. When I got my first job in the computer business working at the Nevada test site, guess what computer I was operating? Uh -huh. A CDC 6400. By the way, there are only like 10 of them in the whole world. So they were just following me around. <laughs> <laughs> That's neat. So what strikes you as when you all were learning technology, whenever it was you were getting interested in it, what strikes you as so interesting and neat about what's going on now? Like, what are the real contrasts in the technology world that you see now versus when you were learning? What really inspires you? So I, I was studying art, and I, um, I read a book called Ways of Seeing by John Berger, maybe Berger, um, and it had this point in it where it talked about how if you were doing paintings, uh, there would only be one painting, and some rich person got to buy it. And I'm like a middle class kid from the Midwest, and I was like, that kind of sucks, you know? That like, you know, that there's one rich person who gets to own this thing that I work so hard on. And what I always found really appealing about the internet was like the barrier of entry to appreciate and distribute the content was so, was so low. Um, and I'll, I'm, although like, there's, you know, there's a lot of people who don't have access to the internet, which I think is another kind of problem, but so many people do, and I'm actually really, I was really drawn to that, I'm really pleased that I'm in a place where basically anything that we do gets to be consumed for free by like hundreds of millions, or certainly millions of people, uh, in some cases hundreds of millions of people, and nobody, yeah, nobody, it's not just going to like the elite halls of, you know, some rich dude's, uh, you know, guest home in 
the Hamptons. I, you know, for me, the, the most interesting thing about the things that I've made had been the unintended consequences, the second and third order consequences. So most of the people in this room know me probably around a single piece of video game called John Madden Football. And uh, I had a lot of fun making that. I was a bad football player, but, um, you know, I spent most of my time getting stuffed in lockers by those guys instead. Um, <laughs> And most of the nerds have never forgiven me for inviting the jocks into the computer game business, but that's a different story. What was interesting to me about that game was I built a video game for people to play that was really designed to have somewhat of a simulation based on football, but it was supposed to be easy to play. And it was so adopted, so loved by the people who, made, who played football, including professional football players. And the influence it's had on them is just beyond my ever, any comprehension. So kind of most famous one of those events was a few years ago, a player from the Denver Broncos during a preseason game was returning an intercepted uh, pass for a touchdown. And he ran right up to the goal line, and when he got to the goal line, he turned left. And he ran along the goal line all the way to the pylon until the players from the other team finally got to him. And then he stepped in the end zone. And during that time, he burned off another six and a half seconds. There was only 11 seconds left on the clock at the time. So what he had done is dramatically reduced what the opposing team could use against him. And when they interviewed him about it, he says, we do it in Madden all the time. Otherwise, you'd give guys 10 seconds, they'd beat your ass. <laughs> uh, one of the spaces we're really interested in right now that relates to this audience is education. You know, the internet's been around for a long time, but in some ways, it's just starting to get into your classrooms and um, with the mobile devices that you're having or the tablets. And, um, it's, it's just changing a lot, and we don't exactly know how it's going to shape out, but we at KQED have been trying to do things like reimagine what the textbook is, right? So that textbook that you passed around for the last three, you know, that was this big, that didn't change much, that probably had Pluto as a planet still in it, or whatever it happens to be, um, you know, couldn't include video or audio or much less things where you could actually interact with it or real time do, do things. So uh, we've been making like these new ebooks and trying to imagine how do you learn biotechnology, or how do you learn about earthquakes um, in a classroom environment uh, today? And so it's really fun to just be, on, be in a place where it's, the rules aren't written yet. It's just like the, all these textbook companies are now just trying to like figure out what to do, and we're right in there with them trying to figure out what to do and interacting with students and teachers and just saying, so you know, what would work for you? How, how, do you, how would we develop this? Uh, it's, it's exciting. Oh, I, I remember when I was growing up in a town called Amritsar. It's a small town in North India by the border of India and Pakistan. And uh, I do remember some summer nights when there would be no electricity. So we would all uh, go on the terraces or the rooftops and sleep in the open, literally. And uh, I would be looking at the stars and asking my mom questions like, why does that star uh, twinkle more than this star? Or how many stars are there in the world? And it, she would tell me that there are galaxies. But then it would get to a point where she would say, I don't know, why don't you ask your teacher? Uh, <laughs> next morning, I would go to school and ask my teacher all these questions. And then my teacher would come up with an answer like, I can tell you this, but why this is the way this is, you'll learn when you grow older. <laughs> and, I, and I always felt that you know, what if, uh, you know, every person in the entire world had access to a teacher who knew it all and could answer whatever question was in your mind? And at that time, we were, we were, I don't think we were close to there, but I think we are closer there today with the information that the internet is providing us, with the information that we can share through videos and through talking to each other, no matter whether you're you know, a few yards apart or a few continents apart. So that today, uh, in my opinion, is sort of the inflection point. That is something I'm very excited about. I know that for my son, as he's growing up, even if I don't have the answers, if his teachers don't have the answers, someone in the world has a better idea than we do and he can still access that information. How does that, does that relate directly to the cloud or storing information? How does that relate to what you're doing now in your job? What are some of the challenges you see? Sure, so, so the challenge of 
getting a lot of information is. You have to store that information somewhere. And you have to store it in a way that is scalable and sustainable. And, and like I said in the beginning, you know, what we call the cloud is in fact physical machines located in different parts of the world. And when you search Google or when you store an email on the cloud, it's actually stored at a physical place in a physical location. And like any physical thing, they get bad over time. You need to repair things. So my job at Google as a program manager for data centers involved looking at the processes that we run in the data centers to make sure that when something needs to be repaired, we, we identify it as quickly as possible, we repair it as soon as possible, and we make sure that even when there is a failure, there is enough uh, plans in place to make sure that there's no permanent damage done. So, so that does involve a lot of exciting problems, like you know, if, if, if this physical location where you're storing so many computers is like a, like a maze of computers, and if five computers get bad in different parts of this maze, how do you select where to start from and where to stop from? stop at. I'll discuss this in more detail in, in the breakout sessions later, but you know, just, just to give you a flavor, these are the challenges that come up with more information and storing it in the cloud. I think um, I'd like to ask the rest of you also, um, what are some of the challenges that you're working on that you might be talking about a little bit in your breakout sessions or that you could share with the students right before lunch? How about? There's a, there's a lot of challenges in speech recognition that before I entered the field, I didn't even realize how amazingly complicated language is. And when someone speaks to their phone and says something like 2014 or 2014 or 2014, those things all mean the exact same thing, probably, for the user that they're trying to represent this one year. But somehow we have to understand that we want to show that as a year and not two space zero space one space four or actually written out in letters versus numerics. And so there's a lot of things like idiosyncrasies about that. And when people speak an address, it's different than speaking a phone number. Or even um, in one of the big things about Google is it's a very international company in the sense that we get many, many, many queries from outside of the US. And so we have to better understand language in every, in every international language as well. And there's a lot of things like segmenting words in terms of where white space goes, um, like how words are broken down. And if you make an error, the meaning is completely different if we split words in different places. And so it's, it's a big challenge to figure out how do we actually break these things down to mean exactly what the user said. And as people, people used to use voice recognition, it, voice recognition has been around for a long time. But it used to be things like you would speak to a regular landline phone and say, you know, would you like to speak to a representative or pay a bill, right? And so it was like very constrained, like you could say one or two things. And over time, especially in the past few years, it's turned into more of a conversation. And so at Google, we're trying to build it so that you can create a conversation and literally just speak to Google like it's a friend and not Googlish, which is like saying weather, Mountain View, we'd rather you be able to say, do I need an umbrella today? And if you say something like, do I need an umbrella today, we're going to show a result like the weather, Mountain View today is rainy with a high of 70. So we're trying to understand that information of what you really meant, um, rather than have you speak in, in what you would typically type into a Google search box. Wow. Oh. What are, Tim, what's, the challenge um, you bring today? So the challenge that we'll work on in our activity is, uh, so we were talking about these new textbooks, these new uh, things that you would have on a tablet or a computer at your, at your classroom. So the challenge we'll do is, just, just like today, when you get an assignment to uh, read a book or watch video, uh, typically the way you demonstrate you, your learning, the, the way you prove to your teacher that you've learned something is to like write a report, right? Everybody's like written gazillions reports, right? Um, but that doesn't necessarily need to be the way that you demonstrate learning today. So our challenge will be uh, take one of these uh, e-books, um, learn a little bit about a subject, biotechnology is the one we'll have, and then what's an activity, either as an individual or a group, 
that would demonstrate that you've learned some concept in this book. So like, say, cloning. And you don't necessarily have to have a white-ruled paper of which you write two paragraphs about what you know about cloning. It could be you make a video, or you uh, design a little information graphic or something like that. So um, that's, that'll be our challenge today. How do you demonstrate learning based in new modes? That's kind of interesting, because you're all students, too. So it's really neat for you to be able to think about how you guys would like to learn what what you think can be improved. Um, one of the things that's so neat about the exhibition that you saw downstairs is that everything is an example of innovation and how to improve ideas. And there's always ways to do that. And I'm curious, Rich, for your challenge, you don't have to go into details, but what are some of the challenges that you and your team face that you might be sharing either at your table later or during your challenge? Sure. Well, I, I think. Uh, you know, over the last 30 years I've been in the video game business, I've had one consistent boss that every time has, has frustrated my ability to get what I want done. And her name is Mom. <laughs> 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 Mom is the one who stands at the door and decides if I get in or not. And that has been a consistent conversation for 30 years. I fortunately recognized it early and have been heavily involved in the process of asking for permission in the ways that Mom appreciates that. Um, what I'm going to ask us to do is, I, I'm working on a gaming system that's designed for what we call the other 80%, the folks who are not console gamers today. And those people have really told us that, um, in particular, that we've asked for too much skill, too much money, but in particular, too much time. And so what I'm going to ask you guys to help me today is to help me make a game for mom. Because the easiest way to get in the door is to come in as something that mom wants first. So that's going to be the challenge that we have in front of us today. <laughs> uh, Ryan, um, I know we're not, your team might not be working on a Google Doodle, per se, but um, what are some of the challenges that you might bring today that are similar to challenges you experience at work? So to Rich's point, I plan, I, what I plan on our group doing is actually I, I asked for a speakerphone because I, I want to call my mom, and we're going to talk a few issues out. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm just hoping that I can get my group to vouch for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll prep them with a few. You mean, you mean that, like, like you have a real job? Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. I went through that phase yeah. for about 10 years. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, no, I mean, so, so on a fundamental level, what we do with Google Doodles is we take this design challenge, uh, this constraint, of, which is pretty weird. Like, I have no illusions that this is like normal at all. Like, we have an amazing. Uh, like I said, an amazing canvas, but we've got to say the word Google somewhere. <laughs> um, but the, to generalize that challenge, it's more about like how do you communicate an idea with a somewhat arbitrary design constraint? And so what, what I plan on doing with y'all is, is it's a bit more of um, more of an art project, um, but we'll take you through a, a design constraint and then try to find a way to solve it, um, communicating what the assignment dictates needs to be communicated. Neat. Sorry, sounds a little bit heady, but... No, no so I'll, I'll riff off of that. For those of you who don't know, it always seems like a clean sheet of paper and, uh, and endless budget is a plus when you're trying to make something. It is just the opposite. Generally, the more real estate and the more opportunity they have, the more you go, okay, now I have to pick the right one. And so what's true is usually a small constraint really frees great creative people to do amazing things. We built a game this year for the Chinese uh, connected television market. We built the whole thing in 12 weeks start to finish. And that was with like five people. So the truth was, constraint in that case was a positive to get us to an outcome. I think you will find the same. Definitely in engineering, the constraints can also yeah, make something bigger or smaller. Or I think you guys are going to find later that also you don't need an incredible amount of time to identify a problem and to figure out some steps in how to actually realize a solution to it. So I know that you guys, I have a ton of questions for these guys, but I'm wondering if any of the students or teachers would like to come and grab the mic here and just walk up and ask questions. Otherwise, I'm happy to go up. Or you can raise, raise your hand and raise your voices. Yeah. Does anyone have any particular question for our OK, this panelists? is going to be just like school. If you don't <laughs> raise your hand, calling you. then we'll be called on. <laughs> yeah, I see a play question over games, there, Lauren. We've got to do five minutes of math. I have a question for Rich. Um, <laughs> on uh, when creating a game, 
do you have to come up with an idea for it, or do you sometimes base it off of some other source or whatever? Ask it again, I'm sorry. Um, when you're creating um, or um, thinking of a process for a video game, mm -hmm. like, what are the problems like you have to solve for it? Like, like what, like what console could it be for? Or like, what's the skill of it? Or what could be the, um, the, the. So what, I think I, I see where you're going. So our controlling influence is usually a couple things. Either I'm trying to make money in an area that we understand how to make money in, and so that that, that will create a, a collection of of constraints that we already understand, or I'm trying to make a product for somebody who doesn't currently play ge games the way that we think about. In that case, it's very important to understand who and why they would play a game first before you figure out what you're going to make for them. And so for us, that process is very much about getting to know a person. I get asked all the time by kids, what's the most important thing that I should learn in school if I want to be in video games? And they imagine it's a technology thing. What I tell people is learn as much as you can about people. Making video games is about making products for people, with people, by people, with people getting in the way and people telling you you're doing a lousy job. The more you know about people, the more successful you'll be. And b by the way, people as a technology changes very little by comparison. <laughs> yeah. There's a question. Good question. I, I have a question for Rich. Um, OK, but the next question has to be for somebody else. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I was wondering, like, in video games, how are like glitches like in games? How do glitches happen in games? Yes. We put them in there on purpose. So that you could enjoy the process of finding them and writing evil things on my Facebook page. About it. <laughs> uh, the answer is these are incredibly complex projects. And in particular, when you start to put online gameplay between lots of different people in lots of different places, in particular in lots of different machines like what happens on the PC, the, the test matrix is untestable. And so what you end up doing is we all test together. And um, I think we've tried to be honest about that. Those games have extensive beta processes. The console guys are not great about letting us do beta testing, and that doesn't help. But the answer is that you guys want really complex, interesting, elaborate, and as a result, we are constantly living slightly beyond where our capabilities are. The good news is that nobody flies an F-16 software with F-16 airplane with this software in it. But um, we're, we're trying. And the answer is when you try really hard, sometimes you fall down. Now it has to be for somebody else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's one. OK, this is for uh, Rena and Ryan. What's the best part about working at Google? And syrup. Yeah. <laughs> the food. Yeah, Audrey. that's I always <laughs> uh, that, I mean, there's a lot of things. There's two pieces. There's all the work piece, and then there's all the perks piece. And um, from the work side, I feel like I've had a really fun time there. I started in the Android team right when the G2 launched, which was the first, or sorry, G1. G1 launch, which is the very first Android phone. And at that time, when I would talk to students or talk to anyone, say, I work on Android, they're like, what's that? No one had any idea what it was. I would show them this clunky big phone. They're like, well, that's not going anywhere. <laughs> and um, you know, I've been on the team watching it grow. And now we activate millions of devices a day. Android's like a huge market segment. And it's so exciting to be part of that. Um, and I've had the chance to work on the first Android device in a lot of different spaces. Um, so that's really exciting. I love the teams I've worked with. They're super smart people all around me all the time, which keeps me motivated. And on the perk side, we have a lot of ton of awesome perks, like really great food, you know, great gems, and all sorts of awesome things that. Barbers. I, yeah, we have barbers. Barbers that come to your door. And it's pretty good. Yeah. We, we don't have barbers. That's yeah. <laughs> so bad. I didn't, I didn't know about this either. <laughs> So I, I think it's just a really great, creative, unique place to work. It's also a very transparent place where you have a lot of access to upper level management and you can hear what their thoughts are and you know they ask for your opinions. And I think that's really important. There's not a lot of secrets within the company and it makes it for a really nice, open environment to be a part of. Have you ever passed out? <laughs> At work? Uh, not yet. Okay. It's also a perk. <laughs> 
true. <laughs> I mean, the, the one thing I would put on top of that is just that the ultimate, I think you said it all very well, and the one thing that, as I said, I, I believe in what Google's doing is like good for the world. And, um, you know, ultimately as an organization that they're really trying to make the world a better place and, and put, put that as their first priority, as, even though they're, they are successful and they do are profitable and all that. I do appreciate that they're, you know, I think at the highest levels of the company do deeply care about improving the condition for people on this planet and the planet in general. So that, that's a motivating factor. They got cool people who work there too. That's sometimes a reason to come to work. Sure. <laughs> What's your favorite part about working at Google? So I think I deeply believe in the mission that we are organizing the world's information to make it usable. And like I said, it goes back to my own personal experience about this desire to have this teacher who can give you the perfect answer all the time. And you having that democratic access to all the information that you want, regardless of who you are, where you are, how rich or poor you are. Um, also, every week we have this thing called the TGIF, where you know the co-founders of Google, Larry and Sergey, uh, they usually come, and it's like a town hall with the whole company. And whoever you are, as a Googler, you can ask them any question. And I, I think that's pretty rare. That's not something that you commonly see across corporations um, anywhere in the world. I once, I once saw somebody ask a question about why there's no more Cheerios in the micro kitchen. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's a very pressing matter. What's it like working at KQED? Uh, you know, it's pretty great. There's, there's a lot of really smart people who are really trying to um, help the community. So it's, it's pretty exciting. I mean, you know, and uh, I would say the number one trait of people there are like they just like to learn. They like to learn new things and grow and try to figure out stuff. Uh, one of the things we're doing now is uh, we're partners with Knight Foundation on funding a, an accelerator. Anybody know what an accelerator is? So there's like Y Combinator and Techstars. Anyway, like if you're a young startup company and you have a new idea, you want to be the next Google or the next EA or whatever, uh, you're a little startup company of two to four people or whatever, and there's a lot of that in Silicon Valley around here. And one of the things that uh, organizations do sometimes is like try to help them out by giving them a little money and like a space to work for five months and mentors and um, you know share it, times to share some of this design thinking that you're going to do this afternoon. Put put people these teams through the process. So I mean, KQED is like a part of this one called Matter about trying to change media for good. So when you try to think about what companies who want to be informing the public and changing media for good are going to be like in the future. Um, I get to go and work with those people. And so you get all these new ideas of people who really want to change the world with their little startup. And you get to um, you know, s help them a little bit. But in a lot of ways, it's really selfish, because you're learning so much from all these people and their new ideas and their energy. And Rich, do people get the chance to learn on the job at Electronic Arts? Uh, Is there a learning <laughs> component there? Yeah, I mean, I think it, I think it has to be. Uh, if if um, we, we, we do a fair amount of teaching in-house. In we've, had, we've had master design and master production classes taught in-house that have uh, filled the coffers of many other organizations. Uh, production staff, Zynga in particular, is pretty dependent on our training, apparently. But anyway, mm -hmm. the, <coughs> the thing that I would say is most interesting about EA, I've been there for 30 years, which is a long time, just means I'm old. But I've stayed at one place, and the reason why is because by standing in one place, the world changed around me all the time. Video games always are pushing the edge of technology and what they can accomplish. And as a result, it, I don't have to go looking for a new challenge. They tend to come to us. The other thing that is true is that there's always a new group of you. There's a new audience that has a new mentality, a new sensibility. You know, The notion that Minecraft would be a product a decade ago is unfathomable to people in my industry. And so the fact that you guys make my business new every day is the reason I come to work. That sounds like fun. <laughs> no, um, I was just going to ask, since the topic of mentors came up once or twice, if any of you have any really interesting mentor stories, because what I'd like you guys to see our panelists as later, as a sort of mentor, that you can ask them questions to help you further along your ideas for your project. But do any of you have any neat examples of mentors you had? I, I do. <laughs> okay. I'll tell about a couple of mentors. So um, 
When I went to Electronic Arts, I had been a computer science student before I, I went there. And I went there because I wanted to work with one of what I consider to be the best computer scientists on the planet. And his name is Tim Mott. Tim is a great guy. He's a venture capitalist. He's done lots of other things. And from the very first day that I worked at Electronic Arts, Tim Mott spent his entire time trying to convince me I was not a computer scientist. And so he spent a decade, you know, he spent basically a decade of my life trying to tell me I was doing exactly the thing that I was supposed to do. I didn't know I was a video game maker when I got there, but he did. And so what he did was change my mind, my self-image, about who I was to what I actually could do, well beyond any capacity or capability that I envisioned for myself. If you find a great mentor, what they will do is they will see things in you that you do not see. That's how you can tell you found the right one. Ask them what they see in you, and if you hear things that you don't see in the mirror, chances are you got the right guy, or young lady for that matter. Any other stories? I think when, uh, when I was switching companies and I had been with my previous one for seven or eight years, I was pretty scared about it because I had been doing really well there, I really liked my job, and I d there wasn't really anything reason to leave. Um, I loved everything there. But I decided I just wanted to try something new. And I had spoke to the, one of the people I worked with frequently and who I would consider a mentor, even though it wasn't like a formal mentorship. Um, and he was a fellow at the company. And so you know, he was pretty senior. And I told him, I'm pretty nervous about, about leaving and going from a hardware company to a software company. You know, they do something completely different. And he told me, you know, you're a great engineer. You're going to do great there. And, like the few things, it's very similar to what Rich was saying. Like he was telling me things that really I didn't realize that someone so much senior to me was recognizing in my work. Um, and so when I, when I started in my new job and everything was new to me, the people were new, the products were new, the concepts were new, like literally everything was new when I was starting on this blank page. Everything that he would tell me, just I would hear it over and over again in my head. And you know, I knew that was what a good mentorship was, someone that you know, helps you um, recognize your strengths and helps you, helps you be confident to take those next steps and those risks. All right, then. Does anyone else have any further questions? Any student questions out there? I see one in the back. This is your last chance for questions before we move forward. And I see one there after. Hi, uh, so my question is in general for everyone. Uh, I, th I believe the, the most important thing uh, to, to make these projects is creativity. So how, how do you get that creativity to make all, all of your work? So I think the question was how do you what inspires you to yeah. be creative at work? Was that it? Yeah. I had, I had one, one uh, teacher in college who had a pretty good quote. And he actually said, inspiration is for amateurs. And um, he, was a, he was an illustrator. But, um, but one way to think of it is like, not to put like a mysterious, like mystical process around it. And just that you're, pro you're problem solving, you know, and like, I mean, if you, were a, if you were a plumber or if you were, you know, a, ho a person who builds homes or if your job was you dug holes, whatever it is, or if you're painting a fine art painting, like, you're still problem solving. And as Rich mentioned, like, you're, you're trying to do so you're, you're, so you're making something in the service of, of people. And if you understand who your audience is and if you understand the, con the, the constraints, uh, you just need to solve that problem. Um, so, you, you know, I think one thing is not, not to stress about it, not to wait for, like, the lightning bolt to strike your head, but just say, hey, today, in this moment, what I'm working on, I want to solve this problem. What's the best way I can do that with the resources that I have? Uh, and then just be honest with yourself about, like, you know, you want to, you want to be excellent, you want to push yourself to go far, um, but don't, don't think that it's like some magical, mystical thing. It really is just you're solving a problem. It, it, the more time you spend with, with great artists, the more you understand how much they iterate, how much they make something and then make another thing and then make another thing and then make another thing. And that that process is not just about refining that first idea, but exploring and finding the next one. And what it does is it just make, gives you the, the confidence to keep doing. The worst thing is to stop and look at the page. And so as long as you're doing an iteration, improving, making a, a refinement, um, you're also learning something else about the problem that will inform you 
more later. Um, the other thing I would say is go out and live. You know, in my particular business, what I have to do is reflect what people want to do, the fantasies that they have or the things that, that pique their imagination. And I can't do that sitting around my office all the time. I have to go out and be with normal human beings who don't look like me um, and who live, you know, much more normal lives. And then when you, when you do, great ideas find you every day. Another thing I've come to believe around that theme is um, it's really important at, and especially at, at an age where you guys are to distinguish as to are you focusing on the process or are you focusing on the outcomes? And I've come to believe that focusing on the process is usually more productive than focusing on the outcomes. So what happens when you change your mentality from focusing on outcome to focusing on processes that your yardsticks for success change? You, you don't end your day asking yourself, did I accomplish a great thing which everyone liked? You ask yourself, did I work hard? Did I learn something new? Am I going to bed smarter than I was when I began the day? So that focus, it shifts our mentality. It shifts our, uh, our identification of our self-worth to the outcomes that are externally dependent. And what I've seen is that over time, if you're focusing on the process and really working well and enjoying your work, the fruits of your hard work, they come automatically. I think we're going to end with that. Um, if you guys have any more questions, you're welcome to ask them at any one of the panelist tables. Each panelist has a table and a whiteboard. And you guys have about an hour to check out some stuff they brought to get a little deeper into your question asking about what they're here with today. And we're really excited you guys came. So I'm going to let the panelists come off the stage with me. And um, you guys should get up and stretch a little, because you've been sitting for a while and listening. So we'd like you for, for each student to visit at least three panelists' tables. And your workbooks have some space to write some stuff in it if you learn something you really think is neat. <laughs>